we were told and we believed that part four was going to be the final chapter. I mean, final chapter as in no more Jason, no more Fridays, no more nothing. Therefore, it was going to be a movie about the death of Jason. It was one of the oddest script developments I've ever been in. We worked speedily on this, and that's probably the reason that Zito wanted to leave that room with a script that he would bleed for. I, I thought I would never hear from the Friday the 13th people again after the first one, because two went by, they did not offer me part three, but the idea of offering me the film where I get to kill Jason made me feel like um, Dr. Frankenstein. I created the monster, and I get to kill him. I thought the, the most interesting way to deal with the movie about the death of Jason was to bookend it with the dead Jason. We had to go back to the location where Friday 3 was shot and uh, re-stage how it might have been. So the shot that got designed was, came down from the, uh, from the beam of the helicopter overhead, came down with it on a crane. And the Steadicam operator was actually standing on the crane, steps off the crane and starts to move and he keeps going and running back and forth. And in the end, the idea is to go through all of this and reveal the dead Jason. I wanted you to be in the presence of the dead Jason so long that in the end, I was hoping that audiences would start cheering him to life. Then they become the authors of his resurrection. And they take the responsibility for that. I don't have to sell it to them. They're, in fact, demanding it. We went through a bunch of guys. We auditioned Jasons and found Ted White, who was a very experienced Hollywood stunt guy. But what I had done prior to coming on the show, I had gone down and rented number two. I think it was two or three. And I watched the way they moved, the way Jason moved. And I decided that I didn't want him to be a big, clumsy old. So I did change it. I, I changed it to where I moved faster and uh, I tried to make the kills a little swifter. I remember being on the set one day, and I said something about how he should twist the head on Bruce Mahler. And I remember him saying, look, you, you, you do the makeup effects, and I'll do the, the stunts, meaning he knows what to do physically and I. So he got up and he walked away, and I looked at Kevin Yeager and I went, and I just jumped up and I followed Ted, and I, and I stopped him, I said, you know what, when you said that, it offended me because I've done stunts. He says, yeah, I heard that about you. Everybody thought the next thing was gonna be a punch, you know, to my head. And from that moment on, we became pals. The casting of, of Kimberly in, in this role was, was, I think, a really good piece of business for us because she really takes Jason on physically. This is not someone who just, you know, screams and, and faints. This is someone who fights him with a hammer and pounds him into the mask. The scenes where I was actually fighting with Ted White, who played Jason, um, yeah, they were really pretty violent. <laughs> you know, he's a stuntman and I'm not. And I, you know, I, we really, really fighting. <laughs> the casting of this, this boy was a big deal and we saw a lot of kids and nothing seemed right. And they finally brought in this young Corey Feldman who had experience, had, he had acted. The scenes with Corey Feldman were great. He was a really sweet boy. I related to him because I was a child actor and I had a lot of empathy for him. He was a mean little kid. Uh, when I say mean, he was very, very active on the set he wasn't very well-mannered, and when I finally got to the scenes where we were upstairs and uh, I had my hand so close to him that I could have gotten a hold of him. <laughs> Still, he could take direction and he, could, he knew the lines and he would do them and do them over again and didn't, you know, wasn't cranky and wasn't childlike. He was professional. I have to say this, as mean as he was, he was very good in the film. I liked him. Uh, I liked the way he did it and I liked the way he worked. I, I felt like he had the energy uh, of an adult as opposed to that of a kid. Some of the uh, kills in the film were designed by script in advance, uh, cooked up, you know, in the writing process. Uh, more of the kills, or some of the better kills, I think, were designed once we had all the special effects people aboard. When Jason kills the nurse, I had two being glued to her leg so the blood would trickle down the side of her leg. But the tubing had come loose. So when Jason was killing her, it was just a, a, a squirt of blood from right in the middle between her legs, hit the floor and formed a puddle, and she peed blood. Hey, honey, you got a sister? Ruff, ruff. 
Tom sat down and went through with me exactly physiologically what would happen if I was being stabbed through the throat, that it would pierce the voice box, that, you know, all the things that it would go through and what would happen to you, what would happen to your voice, so that I could incorporate that as an actor. He had his hand on my head, but you will be absolutely safe, but don't fight me. I think, though, the kill that, that meant the most to me was the kill of Rob in the basement. I'm expecting that Tom Savini is going to come up with some way to hack as much of my flesh away as possible. But you don't see that. You don't see any of the Tom Savini stuff that he designed, really. We didn't want the audience to laugh when I died. He wanted to go to a more level of, of psychological horror than physical. There were some arguments along the way, and w one of those arguments was about the, the, the death of the mother. We see that she's had an encounter with Jason. We know it hasn't turned out well. We never saw the actual poking or anything that went on. We didn't see any gutting or anything, no tools, implements, blood, but we're pretty sure she got it. And the idea to me of kids watching a mother figure being ripped was extremely exciting. They're used to seeing kids being essentially punished for their loss of innocence. To see mom punished, that's grotesque. The studio thought it would be a cool idea to have a dream sequence because it sort of relates to, uh, you know, part one, the original Friday the 13th. I was originally told that this would be the last of the Jason movies, and I was told specifically to use my best screenwriting grammar to indicate that Jason is really dead, we're not kidding, really most sincerely dead. We spent the entire shoot redesigning how, how Jason might get killed. There were a lot of ways, there were all kinds of suggestions. You know, I had a death that I thought would work, it involved a microwave oven, you know, where um, Tommy was also a little amateur inventor and he had a little variable, took a microwave oven apart, put a reflector behind the microwave shooter and melted a toy soldier on one and the thing went up to 10. I thought at the end when, when Jason is chasing his sister, Tommy could jam this thing into Jason's hand, turn it up to 10 and cook Jason's head from within and make it explode. But as we got close to the end, it became clear that the best idea was the most direct one because what happens is it lets your characters really do the killing. So I asked Joe for two things. One, can I take his mask off? Joe said yes. I said two, can I have him touch Trisha's breast? And Joe said no. I think the act of touching the breast would have rendered him so completely human that he has finally thought of something else to do with girls that doesn't involve killing them. That that was the moment that he was completely vulnerable, as we all are in moments of love. And so what I did was I wrote a scene where instead of cutting his head off, which in a sequel he could walk around with it under his arm or in a box, I split his head open from top to bottom with that machete the way you cut an artichoke in half. And I thought that that was at least sufficiently different to think, okay, this is over. But John Vulich one day held up the Dawn of the Dead machete that I put into Lonely Lisa's head. I said, that's it, that's it. We'll have Tommy whack Jason in the head with the machete, but let's go further and have Jason fall on his knees, fall on the machete and slide down the blade. And then I get a, not a rewrite, but an, an update on how we're not really going to put the machete through his head from top to Adam's apple but we're gonna do something different like through the eye. And I knew then that they were leaving room for a sequel. Every death was fast, 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 fast. And then when Jason died, it was slow. So having to trim the effects down to perhaps satisfy the ratings board helped in punching up the, the effectiveness and the shock of Jason's death, you know, because we got to show that. I wanted to leave something for people to build on for, for the subsequent series. And so I wanted Tommy Jarvis to sort of catch the germ of, of menace that Jason had. And that's why I was building him slowly into a character who at the end could become Jason. That scene in the hospital room where I had to put my hand around him and um, they said for me to put my hand at the base of his neck so that I would hide the wrinkles from the skull cap. There's a scene that's not in the film where uh, uh, Tommy is at the water fountain. And so when he turns around, 
uh, water is dripping from his lips in the way that the original little skinny Jason from the first uh, was dripping water. So Tommy was always somebody I thought would live again. As far as I'm concerned, we killed Jason. I mean, we really killed Jason in, in Final Chapter. I can't believe it's been 25 years since I shot that movie. And I never in a million years would have guessed that it would have had such a huge following like it has. You know, after this, he wandered around uh, cities and moons and stuff like this, or whatever he did. I'm glad that he's out there and we could enjoy him some more. But we really did him in as far as I can tell.